Something took this plane and turned it over and turned it back over and then we dropped and we shook back and forth. I mean, it was, I have quite a few miles on me and it was, I can't describe this turbulence. But it had always been one of these up and down, but never this wild gyration. If you look at uh, pictures of jet streams, you know, drawings, you see like this, it's like a tube of air and we must have flown, boom, right into the middle of it. I felt like we were going to die and we had, there was no way out. All of us who fly are used to a little bumpy air. That's why we're often surprised to learn just how much damage and injury turbulence can cause. Every year, at least one commercial jet is extensively damaged by turbulence. But the human toll is far greater. In non-fatal accidents, turbulence is the leading cause of injury to airline passengers and flight attendants. And I remember just crawling and grabbing like this because I wanted to get to my jump seat and it's, uh, the next thing I know, I was off the ground and I was reaching for the seat backs themselves. And then I was on top of this man and his three-year-old son. Unfortunately, an incident like this happens far too often. For example, one carrier reports an average of nine turbulence events per month, resulting in 24 flight attendant injuries every month. We have every reason to believe these numbers are typical. So it's easy to see that we have a serious problem. This video will take a closer look at how we can effectively reduce turbulence-related injuries and damage. We'll begin by looking at the causes of turbulence and how it affects the aircraft, crew members, and passengers. We'll review the factors that affect turbulence encounters and see what crew members can do to ensure the safety of everyone on board. Turbulence is defined as the violent, irregular motion of air currents over a short distance. It can occur anywhere in the world, with incidents tending to mirror predominant root structures and unstable weather patterns. In the United States, most turbulence-related incidents and accidents occur east of the Mississippi River in the southern and eastern parts of the country. Turbulence is caused primarily by convective currents, wind flow obstruction, and wind shear. Convective currents are localized vertical air flows caused by warm air rising. They can be found at any altitude and may cause the formation of cumulus clouds or cumulonimbus clouds at higher altitudes. However, no clouds may form if the air is very dry. Wind flow obstruction is caused when the wind is disrupted by obstacles such as trees, buildings, or mountains. Wind shear occurs when winds traveling at different speeds and or directions cause a shearing condition. Wind shears are found at all altitudes, especially in conjunction with high-level jet streams, low-level temperature inversions, and frontal zones. Everyone who's flown has experienced some degree of turbulence, ranging in intensity from light or moderate all the way up to severe or extreme. With light turbulence, the aircraft experiences slight erratic changes in altitude and or attitude. Crew members and passengers may feel a slight strain against their seat belts or shoulder straps. Unsecured objects may be displaced. But people will have little or no difficulty walking and food service may be conducted. Moderate turbulence also causes changes in altitude and or attitude, but the aircraft remains in positive control at all times. Passengers and crew members now start to feel definite strains against seat belts and shoulder straps. Unsecured objects are dislodged. Food service and walking are difficult. With severe turbulence, the aircraft experiences large, abrupt changes in altitude and or attitude. Large variations in indicated airspeed are common, and the aircraft may be momentarily out of control. People are forced violently against seat belts and shoulder straps. Anything that's not secured is tossed about. Food service and walking now become impossible. Extreme turbulence causes the aircraft to be violently tossed about and may even cause structural damage. It's practically impossible to maintain control under these conditions. For all those on board, the experience can be a nightmare. It took me several months to uh, 
to get over that this uh, incident because I saw the injuries that, that, that occurred. It was almost like a nightmare. Actually, it was a nightmare. It was, it's my nightmare. The only thing that was keeping me in my seat was my seat belt. Uh, I was literally being pushed against the seat belt up and down. Uh, people were screaming. I thought that was it. The plane was going down. Um, I flew to the ceiling, hit the floor, s slammed to the ceiling and the floor over and over. I don't know how many times. It was like she was just a rag doll flying around that cabin. It's an intense uh, force that that uh, that will kill someone if uh, you know if they're in the wrong place. While we may encounter turbulence in any part of the atmosphere, there are some areas where it's most likely to occur. These areas include over hills and mountains, in and near clouds, or in the vicinity of thunderstorms. Light or moderate turbulence often occurs in the lower 5,000 feet of the atmosphere when surface winds range up to around 30 knots and where the air is colder than the underlying surfaces. Severe turbulence is found on the cold side of the jet stream within 50 to 100 miles of its center. It also occurs in troughs aloft or in lows aloft where vertical wind shears exceed 10 knots per 1,000 feet and horizontal wind shears exceed 40 knots per 150 miles. Extreme turbulence occurs in mountain wave situations, in and below well-developed rotor clouds, and in severe thunderstorms. But not all turbulence is so predictable. Clear air turbulence, or CAT, cannot be detected by radar and is difficult to predict because it is extremely dynamic. About the most predictable thing we can say about CAT is that it often occurs above and to the lee side of mountain ranges and on the poleward side of a jet stream. In the northern hemisphere, that's the north side. But CAT can be found anywhere in any layer of the atmosphere. It is not associated with cumuliform cloudiness, including thunderstorms. So CAT often comes as a complete surprise and frequently when the seatbelt sign is off. That's why CAT accounts for a significant number of injuries to passengers and crew members. Later, we'll see that the best defense against this kind of unexpected turbulence is to maintain a state of cabin readiness at all times. In other words, expect the unexpected. Data also show that we can expect the most turbulence-related injuries to occur during the cruise phase of flight. And almost twice as many people are injured during moderate turbulence than in a severe episode. Turbulence is hardest on flight attendants, followed by passengers of all ages. Most people who sustain injuries were in the aisles or not wearing seat belts. In fact, from 1982 to 1993, 98 percent of the people injured were not wearing seat belts, yet most injuries occurred while the seat belt sign was on. It's also important for pilots to recognize that the effects of turbulence in the aft cabin are far greater than those experienced in the cockpit. About 79% of turbulence-related injuries occur to people located in the aft cabin. But what stands out the most in my mind that day uh, would have to be the, the, the intensity of, of, of the turbulence. And I believe it's even more pronounced in the tail of the airplane because of the center of gravity and the fact that the tail is uh, whipping around quite a bit more than what we experience up in the cockpit. So pilots should be aware that while they may be experiencing smooth sailing, conditions in the cabin might be pretty rough. When the turbulence started and it rose to the ceiling, I just remember hitting it so harshly and falling down, like it was somebody was just threw me down on cement sidewalk. That the visible thing was my ankle, but I also got bruised all over the place, plus the fact that I was getting burned from the coffee spilling all over me. Because turbulence is a fact of life when we fly, it may seem inevitable that people will occasionally be injured. But we have much more control over the situation than we may think. There are a number of factors that can help us minimize the effects of turbulence or even avoid it altogether. Some of these include the meteorologist, the dispatcher, flight crew training, complacency, crew communication, and auto flight system management. One way for flight crews to avoid turbulence is to consult turbulence forecasts and summarized reports produced by government or company meteorologists. 
use these reports to become familiar with potential hazard areas. The dispatcher also plays a key role in avoiding turbulence encounters. The dispatcher is in the best position to gather incoming weather information from many available sources and should issue a release and flight plan to avoid forecasted areas of significant turbulence. In addition, the dispatcher should transmit new information to the flight that might affect its safety. Flight crew training also affects the outcome of a turbulence encounter. Training must be upgraded to provide the knowledge or skills to deal effectively with the turbulence threat. Complacency is another major factor in turbulence-related injuries. Crew members become complacent simply because turbulence is so common and because many encounters seem insignificant. But as the following real-life incident shows, a flight crew that's complacent about entering areas of turbulence can endanger everyone on board. When cruising between layers, we notice some activity on the radar along our route of flight. I thought about making a PA and turning the seatbelt sign back on. I also thought about asking ATC for a deviation, but what we saw on the radar didn't appear like very much, so I felt there was no hurry. 10 to 15 miles before reaching the displayed weather, we encountered severe turbulence. It was a very rough ride, and the aircraft lost about 500 feet of altitude. The flight attendant was not seated and ended up on the floor. Complacency can also affect passengers because they simply don't know how much damage turbulence can cause. Besides, they see flight attendants moving around while the seatbelt sign is on, so don't see the harm in doing the same thing. And we also encounter culture and language differences. Some people may not understand the seatbelt message or may be used to ignoring it in their own countries. So it's crucial to make sure that all passengers understand the importance of wearing their seatbelts and do so. Communication between the cabin and cockpit also plays a vital role in the outcome of turbulence encounters. The cockpit crew must inform the cabin crew of impending turbulence, just as the cabin crew must inform the pilots of conditions in the cabin. And the cabin crew should understand that they may have to secure the cabin or seat themselves without orders from the cockpit. Improper use of auto flight systems is yet another factor in turbulence-related incidents. Later, we'll review how to manage the auto flight system to minimize the impact of turbulence on the aircraft and its occupants. But for now, listen to the following real-life incident for a better understanding of what can happen when the flight controls are not properly used. The flight encountered moderate turbulence during cruise at flight level 330. A lateral gust induced a roll of about 30 degrees during which the autopilot was disconnected. The wings were rolled level, then to approximately 32 degrees in the opposite direction. The pitch attitude, responding to elevator inputs, increased steadily to about 16 degrees nose up, and the aircraft stalled and pitched down. The pilot continued to apply nose-up elevator deflection as the aircraft nose was dropping due to stall. Aileron and elevator control deflections commanded by the pilot resulted in excessive roll and pitch excursions and at least four aerodynamic stalls over a period of about 2 minutes 45 seconds. The pilot thought that the aircraft was experiencing severe turbulence rather than recognizing that he was inducing buffet as a result of a stall. In addition to these factors that affect turbulence encounters, there are many direct actions that the crew members can take either to avoid turbulence or to reduce its impact. For example, while at the dispatch office, pilots are advised to analyze pilot reports and weather data to plan a route that will avoid turbulent areas. Many computer flight plans contain vertical and horizontal shear information which may pinpoint the location of turbulence. Avoid flying into areas where vertical shears exceed 6 knots per 1,000 feet or where horizontal shears exceed 40 knots per 150 miles. But flight planning may not always accurately predict the location of all areas of turbulence. Therefore, it may often be necessary to take steps to avoid turbulence once airborne and that becomes a more complex issue involving the aircraft's radar, ATC assistance, and the experience and knowledge of the flight crew. 
If the aircraft's radar detects echoes more than 100 miles away, they most likely indicate areas of significant weather. Make detours to avoid these areas at the earliest possible time. Note that ATC controllers can detect areas of precipitation, but do not yet have the radar capability to differentiate these areas from severe storms. Overfly thunderstorms if it's possible to clear storm tops by at least 10,000 feet and never less than 5,000 feet. Remember that a thunderstorm in the building stage may grow at over 6,000 feet per minute and contain severe turbulence well above it. Also remember that when climbing to higher altitude for smoother air, the margin to buffet onset is reduced. Many turbulence encounter incidents and accidents have occurred near the limits of the aerodynamic envelope, as you'll see in the following incident. While cruising at flight level 330, I experienced continuous light chop and thought about climbing to flight level 370 for a smoother ride. I checked the performance data and found that the operation at flight level 370 was in a narrow range between low and high speed buffet for our gross weight at G loads of 1.25 at a 37 degree bank angle. Since I didn't anticipate such G loads or bank angles, I asked for and received clearance to flight level 370. Just as I leveled off, we encountered moderate turbulence, which I perceived put us in the low-speed buffet area. I had no choice but to lower the nose to avoid possibly getting into a stall while simultaneously requesting a lower altitude. From now on, I will give myself more margin for error when deciding whether or not to operate in an authorized but marginal area of the envelope. Flying around thunderstorms is yet another option when it comes to avoiding turbulence. Choose to fly around the upwind side if possible, because the downwind side may contain severe turbulence above or below the anvil line. If downwind deviation is necessary, avoid the main body of the storm by at least one mile per knot of wind at flight level. As we mentioned earlier, clear air turbulence cannot be detected by ground-based or onboard radars. Known areas of CAT are broadcast by pilot reports or significant meteorological reports. Even when it's not possible to avoid turbulence, there are still many things crew members can do to minimize injury. Pilots should brief flight attendants at the earliest possible time. The briefing should include the estimated time until reaching the area, the estimated intensity and duration of the turbulence, necessary actions before and after entering turbulent conditions, and the details of the PA announcement. If the decision is made to secure the cabin, make sure flight attendants have enough time to do so. Flight attendants can also do a great deal to reduce turbulence-related injuries by keeping the cabin at minimum readiness levels at all times. This begins by letting the passengers know that it's important to obey the seatbelt sign. Periodically check to see that every passenger has his or her seatbelt fastened, and not just when the seatbelt sign is on. Many passengers, especially children, aren't aware of the potential for injury during turbulence, so they simply ignore the seatbelt sign and the PA announcements. Also check overhead bins to ensure that they're properly latched. Be aware of any loose items, from people to soda cans, that could become missiles, and stow service items and carts when not in use. Locate the nearest empty seat in case you have to quickly use it, and keep in mind that the nearest seating area might be the floor. Readiness is one of the best defenses against turbulence-related injuries, but once the turbulence has started, crew members can still help minimize its impact. When turbulence is light, the captain can turn on the seatbelt sign at his or her discretion. But for anything more than light turbulence, the seatbelt sign must be on. The captain should then make an announcement instructing flight attendants and passengers to be seated. An interphone call to the flight attendants should follow, briefing them on the expected intensity and duration of the turbulence. During light turbulence, flight attendants must make sure that seat belts are fastened and that all infants and children are secured. Check to see that laboratories and bassinets are unoccupied. Secure unattended carts and make sure that loose items are stowed. 
When walking becomes difficult, flight attendants should sit down and fasten their seat belts. Do not jeopardize your safety by moving around the cabin during periods of severe turbulence. In fact, if the flight becomes bumpy, don't wait for the captain to turn on the seatbelt sign. Go ahead and make a cautionary PA. Then ask the captain to turn the seatbelt sign on. And when I return, if it starts shaking a bit in the back, I will be very comfortable picking up that phone and telling the pilot, you know, hey, you know, we need to be seated back here. This is really getting rough on us. I think there's a misconception that they, the flight attendants feel that they have to take their jump seat. If it's bad, grab a seat any seat. Strap yourself in. In addition to maintaining good communication with the cabin, there are several actions the flight crew should perform to get through the turbulence with minimal disruption. Establish ignition so that an ignition source is always available in case of unusual attitudes or ingestion of heavy precipitation. Minimize throttle adjustments. Throttle should be adjusted only to prevent excessive airspeed variations or to avoid exceeding red line limits. Manage thrust to maintain turbulence penetration speed. Fly to a speed that is within the lowest range of turbulence penetration Mach numbers or air speeds published for the aircraft. This will reduce the amount of stress on the aircraft structure. Let the autopilot do the work. Most aircraft are equipped with autopilots that will effectively compensate for turbulence. Do not attempt to overpower the autopilot with control forces because this can cause the autopilot to disengage with too much control input, resulting in over control during recovery. If the autopilot disengages, the pilot should smoothly apply minimum control force inputs to maintain attitude. Altitude may be sacrificed to maintain attitude. The autopilot may be re-engaged as soon as it's available after recovery. If jet stream turbulence is encountered with direct head or tail winds, change course or altitude since these areas are elongated with the wind and are shallow and narrow. Maintain course if jet stream turbulence is encountered in a crosswind because the present course will most likely offer the least exposure time. When crossing a jet stream, climb with the rising temperature and descend with a descending temperature if possible. When the cockpit crew advises that it's safe to resume cabin duties, flight attendants may get up and start returning the cabin to normal. Turn the cabin lights to bright. Calm the passengers and check to make sure that no one is hurt. Let the captain know if there are any injuries or damage. If the seatbelt sign continues to remain on after the turbulence has passed, check with the captain to see if it's still safe to conduct duties. After any turbulence encounter, pilots are required to report the event as soon as possible. Pilot reports often provide the best available information for turbulence encounters and may be the only information about CAT encounters. Reports should include aircraft location, time of occurrence, intensity, whether turbulence occurred in or near clouds, aircraft altitude or flight level, type of aircraft, and the duration of the turbulence. These reports are the first line of defense and should be widely disseminated to the ATC agency currently in radio contact, in the blind to other aircraft, and to the airline. As we've seen, a little bumpy air has the potential to cause serious damage to aircraft and debilitating injury to passengers and crew members. Just because turbulence seems to go with the territory doesn't mean we can take it for granted. Avoid turbulence whenever possible, and if you must fly into it, take the necessary steps to reduce its impact. Your fellow crew members and passengers are depending on you. Thanks for watching.